Hi everyone, welcome to the first lecture capture in Bio 107, brought to you in a short, punchy chunk. So let's go! How is science evaluated? We're going to talk about how real science is uh, ends up published and what science we should believe in what is a bunch of crap. So what do I mean by that? I've talked about in class how everything we know or think we know or is a hypothesis that's supported or set at a theory has been done through experimentation. So how are those disseminated to the rest of the scientific community and to the world? Well, there's two different ways essentially of what we would say uh, information that we would trust. One is primary literature, and the second is secondary literature. Primary literature is peer-reviewed, which means it's reviewed by other scientists in your field, experts in your field, and it's made up of new data, new experiments, novel experiments that have never been done by anybody else. And so those sorts of things are in specific scientific journals with all the gory details involved in that experimentation. Secondary literature, on the other hand, is a subset of the primary literature. So it's an individual or a group of individual scientists that read all the primary literature on a specific subject or like a specific protein, for example, and they interpret it and put it all together into one publication that is also peer-reviewed to make sure it's not biased by that one person or that one group's opinions on the topic. Um, and then publishes what we would call a review paper. Okay, so that's much different than something that's primary. Primary has new experiments, new data. Secondary is a review or put all that new data together. So secondary literature is really great for when you want to learn about a topic, but you don't want to evaluate every single experiment that's ever done. Thousands of primary literature publications all boiled down into one review. So much easier just to read the review. And then if something doesn't look right or you want to know more about a specific part, you can go back and look at the references where they got their information is all cited and look at the primary literature that's involved in that review. So here's an example of primary literature, and how do you know if something's primary or secondary? That's a good question, because if you go to a site where we search for publications, like if you're interested in Parkinson's disease and you want primary literature and secondary literature, you want to learn more about it, you would go to a pub, the PubMed search engine and you would type in Parkinson's disease. So you can get to these um, search engines through the library site from CSUN, and you would then look for specific primary literature. If we were looking for, let's say, a specific type of cancer, mantle cell lymphoma, and we type that in, what we would find is primary research and some reviews. You can specifically search for a review by limiting your um, hits to being just reviews or everything. And so how do you know that it's primary research? Well, when you look at the abstract and what they actually did, it's clear that they've done their own experiments. Okay, and it usually somewhere, right, has the journal name, right, talks about the title of the study, and then the list of authors that contributed to this work. And so if we looked at what happens in the materials and methods, it talks about specific experiments that were performed in this actual research. So it talks about um, bidirectional suppressive subtractive hybridization. That's an experiment using primary tumor samples. Right, northern blot analysis, okay, so uh, specific experiments that were done, that were performed for finding out new data. Secondary literature, on the other hand, which, again, it's generally referred to as a review, almost always says review somewhere on it, right? 
And the title is not specific about one experiment or one conclusion. It talks about, right, how does this type of protein work? How does cellular migration happen through this family? Okay, if you look at the summary of what they're doing on here, right, it doesn't have any specific experiments. It says, right, these proteins do something, right? Blah, 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 expression sites. They can mediate this migration, right? And not confined here, but they, a whole bunch, this review focuses on the activities of the slit proteins, right? A whole bunch of them. And then if you looked through the article, there wouldn't be any new experiments, okay? It's just a review of what's out there. Both of these have to go through a process before they get to publication. Okay, we talked about peer review. What is peer review? Peer review is where the individual, so like my lab and my students, we would do a whole bunch of experiments. We would write up a manuscript with the abstract, intro, materials and methods, results, figures, legends, conclusions, uh, discussion, references that we used and then we send it out to a journal we'd like it to be published in. That journal then sends it out to independent scientific experts, other professors, other scientists in our field that work on very similar things, right? If it's mantle cell lymphoma, they'd send it to other people working on mantle cell lymphoma or a specific type of experiment, subtractive hybridization, send it to those other people who do that experiment. People who know the systems and know the experiments. Know what should be done and how it should be done. So it's sent out to there and they review it. There's a bunch of questions they answer and they essentially look at all the design of the experiments, make sure they're controlled. If they think any of them suck, they tell you this legend is unclear. Fix. Right? This is not properly controlled. You need to do these extra experiments. Many times these reviewers are rude and mean and they make you do more and more experiments and things that are impossible to do and it could take months and months longer to fix the problems that they see, right? Especially for the controls and make sure what and, and your interpretation of the results. So generally if something gets published in a scientific journal, it's about as good as it can be, as well controlled that at least three other scientists aside from the group agreed that it was worthy of publication and at that point they did everything they could to come up with accurate results. And so again, things aren't always correct and but generally under those conditions with those controls are as good as they can be. So that's why we trust scientific publications because of this peer review process. It's not just some Yahoo posting on their website. I could put anything on my website. I could post all kinds of falsified data and charts and graphs and, and conclusions. And it's, you know, freedom of speech. I can write whatever I want up there, which is why we don't trust websites. We trust scientific publications, not websites of some random scientists doing stuff in their garage or basement. That being said, websites that are... Uh, responsible and that you could trust are places like the American Cancer Society where what they write up there has references to it. Like if they make a statement about some statistics of some study, they will reference the primary research article that they got that from. So you can trust that they're not BSing you. Okay, what else is out there? Aside from primary research and secondary research, which is all based on experimentation in some sort of model system, there's epidemiology. That's studying patterns of disease in populations, you know, with risk factors. What, so what does this mean? This is really in humans, right? If we use model systems, mice, uh, Drosophila, worms, so forth, we can do a lot of manipulations and a lot of experiments that we would never do with human beings, Right? You could put a Drosophila model or you know, some sort of nematode model, worm model, in a smoke-filled environment and have them live there, grow up in smoke-filled environment versus something in normal air, and then look to see what kind of damage, if there's anything that, 
the smoke particulate or nicotine or any of that stuff does to those organisms. We would never do that to humans. Tell them, here, smoke for 30 years and come back. You're not allowed to smoke for 30 years. Come back, and then we'll look and see, you know, what your problems are. No. What happens is we look at statistics from university hospitals about different diseases, right, different um, risk factors of certain uh, problems. So, like, anybody who's diagnosed with lung cancer, you always have to fill out the health report. If you're at a university, that's reported to the CDC, the Center for Disease Controls, or the NIH, the National Institutes for Health, to compile that data for epidemiological studies. And so then they look at, wow, people who smoke have a very high risk of lung cancer. That doesn't mean we can say with just that correlation that it's causative, but then if we actually do a mouse model of smoking and they get lung cancer or just treat cells with smoke and they turn cancerous, we can come to, yes, smoking causes lung cancer, okay? But there are people who can smoke forever and never get lung cancer, right? So it's a correlation. You're at higher risk for getting lung cancer, okay? So the other epidemiology that's not human-based would be phenomena in nature that you can't recapitulate in a laboratory, okay? Global warming. We can do lots of experiments suggesting how all these particulates in the air can cause warming in the lab, but on a planetary scale, we can't do that. So that's making observations and comparisons in nature to, to find correlation. That's not causation. Epidemiology is always correlation. Relationship between a variable, smoking, and something else, lung cancer. In this example here, they're talking about drinking coffee and risk of Parkinson's. And this correlation suggests from this epidemiological study that the less coffee you drink, the higher incidence of Parkinson's. The more coffee you drink, the lower incidence of Parkinson's. Does that mean coffee, you know, protects you from Parkinson's? We don't know. The sample size, this could have been 100 people. Right? I don't know how many was in there. Was it 100? Was it 1,000? Was it 10,000? Was it a million? Right? The more people in the study, the more likely those relationships hold true. Right? There's always other possible explanations. What if it's not the caffeine in it? Right? We would immediately, ooh, reduce caffeine intake. What if coffee, there's something else in, in coffee? Right? What if it's one of the the isoflavones or one of those other, you know, protective plant blah, blah, blah that everybody's always yammering about, okay? Maybe it's just people who drink coffee also do something else with coffee that is, is, is um, bleh, preventative, okay? So it's a causation. It's a, co uh, sorry, uh, it's not a causation. It's a correlation, Right? Only correlation. That's all we can say. The more studies done, the bigger the correlation, the better the correlation. All right. What else? What about, again, being cautious when you look at epidemiological studies, especially a single one. But these are the kind of things that the media goes crazy for. One study, one small sample size study, right? that maybe was peer-reviewed, but they did a bad job, wasn't controlled well, was just a bad study, came up with some result that got everybody crazy. What's an example of that? Vaccines and autism. There is absolutely no association. There is no correlation. Nothing. Zero. No. Nah. That's the stupidest thing. There was one epidemiological study done in Europe, not controlled, very small sample size, and they didn't control for socioeconomic status, and they showed 
between the kids who were vaccinated and weren't vaccinated, the ones that were vaccinated had a higher incidence of autism than those that were not. And it was all socioeconomic status, had nothing to do with vaccines. There were hundreds of other studies done that negated that study, but the media hopped on that like crazy, the crazy, uh, very scientifically ignorant celebrities jumped on that and people stopped vaccinating because they were scared to death that their kid would be autistic. Total crap. Perfect example of the media doing something out of proportion and totally screwing over the public to an actual detriment of, of real people and kids. The measles epidemic right now, yep, almost all unvaccinated individuals getting the measles. Way back when, before vaccinations, 35% of everybody with measles died. Vaccinate your children. So, right, we rely on peer-reviewed. The public relies on the media and believes celebrities instead of scientists. Sometimes not completely accurate. Sometimes complete crap. Sometimes they look at something, right, these journalists that are the scientific experts may have only taken bio 100, right? They don't know how to evaluate science or when they shorten the article to make it punchy and exciting, totally changes the meaning and totally interpreted wrong. So we don't listen to the media. We take it with a grain of salt and we look it up. We don't believe websites. We don't believe viral emails. We use our brains and we think and we can always go to the primary literature to find out if something is true or not. So that is our first punchy, short ooh, lecture capture. I hope you've enjoyed it. Ooh, thank you. See you, eh? Yeah. Good day.